485.4 million years ago, the Cambrian period was over and the Ordovician period began. The Ordovician period entered into our human conceptualizations of history when competing schools of scientific thought had rock layers of the same time period's deposits, which one group was subsuming into the Cambrian period and the other into the then immediately following the Cambrian Silurian period. To resolve this disagreement, Charles Lapworth inserted the Ordovician between these two periods for the rocks in the debated layers, and so I find myself here with the Ordovician period being a reasonable topic to consider while exploring and constructing the history of everything and the playlist of Threshold 5 of Big History more particularly, which is the story of life's history. As we saw earlier in our exploration of the Ediacaran and Cambrian periods, most phyla had come to be by the time the Cambrian period had come to a close. Maybe all major phyla had come to be, but one in particular, Bryozoa, may not have started until the early Ordovician when we have our oldest evidence for them. This fact of the filling out of the major phyla by the end of the Cambrian leads to one fairly neat conceptualization of the continued explosion of life that we see in the Ordovician, differentiating it from the Cambrian in that the Cambrian saw the making of the basic forms of almost all the major phyla, while the Ordovician saw a major explosion in the diversity at lower levels in our tree of life of the orders, families, genera, and species. Order is multiplied twofold in the so-called gobi, or gobe, but I think gobi. Feel free to laugh at me in the comments if I'm mispronouncing it. I would love that. Comments, that is. Laughing at me, less so. Uh, gobi, for great Ordovician biodiversification event, and while orders had increased twofold, families increased threefold, and the number of genera and species skyrocketed. This further fleshing out of life that we see in the Ordovician saw species fill more niches and create some new niches as well. And it also continued the growth and size and complexity of some life with deeper and more complex burrowing and moving or growing higher in the water. The flowering of life in the Ordovician would come to a temporarily calamitous end in a mass extinction at the end of the period. Not to worry though, we weren't there. I mean, I guess our ancestors were, but they clearly made it. Life will pick up from its battered stage again in the coming period, the Silurian, which I hope to consider in the next video. Okay, so Gobi. As per the work of some scientists, namely the scientists who wrote this paper on Gobi, Gobi can be split into three stages, and I'm going to follow their model. I linked their paper below, and I also left numerous lectures that I found helpful to better understanding the Ordovician more broadly, including the geological story, which I'm almost entirely ignoring for the sake of posterity. It's for the kids. Speaking of, for all the children and all the innocence and all the beauty in the world, touch the thumbs up indicator beneath this video and treat my comment section like you treat Twitter, get overly emotionally charged, and remember that you are easily the smartest person to have opened your mouth on whatever the given topic is. The first stage of this biodiversification event picks up in the world of the rather small, the planktonic revolution. In this first stage, the diversity of organisms floating in the water column increased. This started picking up some 10 million years before the Ordovician period in the late Cambrian, although many planktonic groups only appear after the start of the Ordovician. Phytoplankton saw a major diversity pop in the late Cambrian, and radiolarian diversity jumped as well. While radiolarian data remains sparse, phytoplankton continued a softer increase in diversity through the early to middle Ordovician. Chitinozoans first appeared in the first stage of the Ordovician, the Tremidocian, increasing in diversity in the following Floian stage. The same is true, appearing first in the Tremidocian of the Ordovician and then increasing in diversity in the Floian for the free-floating Graptolites. Graptolites of the phylum Hemichordata are of particular interest for a reason beyond their role in the planktonic revolution, namely dating. Graptolite's widespread distribution and short-term species duration make them great for dividing time, and they're used for differentiating the various time snaps of the Ordovician. Graptolites had started in the Cambrian affixed to the floor, 
But now in the Ordovician, some started floating in the water column to the point of most forms being free floating. The second stage of Gobi picked up around 480 million years ago with a diversification boon, which was particularly salient in the Middle Ordovician, and the explosion was in benthic zone diversity. The benthic zone is the area of the sediment surface and the area hugging the sediment surface above and below. While many benthic groups' data are insufficient for this time period, two groups that can be more meaningfully engaged with are the brachiopods and echinoderms. Brachiopods, or arm foots, also known as lambshells, are filter feeders which fall into two varieties, articulate and inarticulate forms. The benthic zone bottom level community revolution had the brachiopods diversifying lots in the early and middle Ordovician with another bump in the late Ordovician. Echinoderm means spiny skin, and their sophisticated little radially symmetric calcite skeleton secreting nutsos with a mouth, stomach, intestines, and a water vascular system. Of the echinoderms, the Ordovician sees the introduction of the blastoids, crinoids, sea urchins, and starfish. The echinoderms diversified greatly, starting in the early Ordovician, though the crinoids, or starfish-ish popsicles, meanwhile picked up in a diversification frenzy in the late Ordovician. Some exceptional crinoids of this era reached 10 feet tall. Getting going slightly after the start of the second stage, starting some 465 million years ago, the third stage sees a revolution in reef communities. This stage, if you will, and bear in mind that all of these so-called stages are really composed of distinct, with at times not so neatly aligned with each other, radiations of organisms. Either way, this third stage sees the increase in the diversity of the reef builders, the bryozoans, the sponges, the stromatoporoids, and the corals, with proper corals actually first coming to be in this period. The bryozoans anchor themselves to a hard surface and filter feed in moving water, and they're the only major phylum to not appear in the fossil record until the Ordovician period, and so it may be that they indeed first appeared in the early Ordovician period. Stromatoporoids are sponge-like creatures of the phylum Periphera, they're filter feeders that start up in the middle Ordovician. Onto corals, which fall under the phylum Cnidaria. Considering reefs prior to corals, you had stromatolites building something you can call a reef-like structure for over 2 billion years, and archaeocyathids picking up in the Cambrian. But archaeocyathids are not actual corals, and the first actual corals came to be by the mid-Ordovician. They're filter feeders that are producing a shelly material made of calcium carbonate, or CaCO3. Getting along with periphera, including notably the stromatoporoids, and creating extensive tropical reefs together with them were the tabulate corals. These corals were exclusively colonial and are sometimes called honeycomb corals. In contrast to these colonial corals, there were the rugose corals, which came in both solitary individual and colonial forms, but were exclusively in solitary individual form in the Ordovician. These guys are called horn corals sometimes, for obvious reasons, to cite capable people with the capacity for metaphorical thinking. Though the biosphere of the Ordovician was rather dissimilar to that of the Cambrian, the most famous player of the Cambrian, the Trilobites, while taking a hit at the end of the Cambrian, were still bustling around in the Ordovician. Another arthropod character, the filter-feeding, crawling, and burrowing ostracods, some versions of which were pelagic, sees a great diversification in the Ordovician as well. Meanwhile, Mollusca, which had seen the introduction of cephalopods in the Cambrian and a crash in genera diversity with an extinction near the end of the Cambrian, now in the Ordovician saw a diversification as well. Another important fossil type from this period, which actually started in the late Cambrian, are these conodont fossils, the color of which often providing insight into the temperature of the metamorphism it's been involved in. At the end of the Ordovician, there was a mass extinction in which something like 86% of all species disappear from the fossil record, never to be heard from again. This goes down around 444 million years ago. Cooling temperatures set in, and the already over the South Pole for a couple of million years Gondwana glaciated, lowering sea levels by around 100 meters. Much of the lower water areas over the continents and former shallow shelf areas disappeared as the water needed to cover them got locked up in the ice, and thus habitat destruction contributed significantly to this extinction. 
Coral reefs are decimated as 50 of the 70 genera go extinct, and many warm water adapted creatures across the board see their lives end in this cold snap. Then a second stage of extinction commenced, less intense than the first, as temperatures returned to warm and many cold adapted creatures died out. You can't just adjust to the new situation and think you're safe. That might just be what kills you next. But hey, we're not safe. We're all gonna die. But thankfully, much life got through this relatively narrow window, and we'll turn to their story in the coming video on the following period in time, the Silurian.